welcome everyone to today's CG webinar, which in the seminar series is number 210. Good to see some people coming in now and some familiar faces. Um, today we've got Zach Spy with us, who's a postdoctoral researcher from UCL. His research focuses on student residential accommodation, student engagement and higher education. He's our our place and space person at CG because this is his second webinar with in this general family of themes. Um, before we start, let me take you through the webinar protocols. Let's try and remember what they are uh, after uh, two weeks away from the webinars. Uh, remember that the webinar is being recorded. Uh, it'll be up within forty eight hours or so on our website. It's on YouTube, and we also post the chat. Now, uh, we recommend that you use speaker view to go to um, view who, whoever is speaking at a given time. Um, we advise you to keep your sound off during the webinar, but of course, when we come to the stage of the Q&A and you're invited to ask your question, it's a good idea to turn your sound on at that point. With your video, um, it sometimes helps, I think, if you turn your video off, but uh, turn it on, of course, when you come into the Q&A part of the webinar. Um, to ask questions, use the chat function. Uh, type your question into the chat and we'll compose a Q&A list on the basis of what's coming through there. Uh, usually a good idea to come in early. Sometimes the best questions come in too late to be part of the Q&A because the call list is already full. So do take that opportunity. Uh, so at this point, I'm really happy to hand over to Zach and to wish him the best of luck in his second CG webinar. Uh, thanks, uh, CGHE and uh, Professor Marginson uh, for the opportunity and the invitation. I'm just gonna pop in and share my slides really quick uh, as I start on uh, the Prezo and welcome everyone. Thank you so much um, for joining in. I wanted to pick up on a topic I think that many of you will probably be very familiar with um, and issues that many of you will likely be very familiar with and just revisit um, questions around the physical university and the university estate. Um, I think there's a huge amount of interest um, information swirling around the university estate. So I wanted to spend a bit of time uh, trying to look at what's been said and done, uh, what we might do with it, um, and how something like COVID-19 has impacted our idea of the relationship of student staff and the wider public to the university. Um, let me go through. Uh, just a roadmap, I wanted to propose a couple of key questions I made up. I did a literature review and tried to understand, as I say, what others have said um, and done. I also looked at a number of data drivers, staff and student numbers and estates, um, physical estates numbers, uh, the position and purpose of the physical estate, the university estate, and the way it's been positioned through existing lenses, I thought would also be very helpful to sort of allow us an opportunity to generate, I hope, more questions um, and to look at some of the key themes and issues that have been emerging both in the literature and also more generally in the public discourse. Uh, and to also, when I say explore maybe what the impact of COVID-19 was for uh, university estates, um, many of us are very familiar with the sort of emergency closures and uh, non-returns or uh, only essential personnel, in quotes, um, allowed to return to the university's physical estate during COVID-19. This had immense implications for research activity, for relationship maintenance, and just for the general sense of the routines and rhythms and rituals that I think many people rely on when they formulate what it is they mean by participating in and with the university. Uh, and really to ask maybe finally, what now? What do we do with the university estate now? There are several scholars who have very strong views on both the cost and benefit of the physical estate and university estates to students, staff, and the wider public. And maybe to ask how we might go forward with that. So just to sort of start off, 
my, my key questions really were, what is the existing literature and research on the university estates and their management and operation? What, what has been said and done? And what role do university estates play in university management strategies? Um, I think this is something that several scholars, particularly from my own history in the Institute of Education at UCL, are very keen to ask sort of, this is functionally um, really important, but how so and why so to the operation and administration of higher education institutions? Um, and what influence did COVID-19 have on current and future university estate operations, management and physical space use? Um, as Professor Marginson mentioned, my focus generally is always on the physicality and social nature or the physical as an underpinning of the social for university activity. Um, and I'm, I'm very interested to sort of hear what others have to say about what COVID-19 has done for their own experience and for the experience of their colleagues or peers and students and, and who they connect with. Um, in my literature review, I did a really simple search, um, University States Management Operations, and I focused on the context of England. Um, my date range was generally speaking the last sort of five years, 2016 to 2021. Um, you'll notice in the data that I presented, it starts at 2015, 2016. Um, that's obviously because HESA um, has just, delineated the, the starting point the year before and, and just um, uh, for that purpose. Um, I used ERIC and UCL Discovery. I included peer reviewed journal articles, book chapters, thesis and dissertations, policy documents, institutional documents, some newspaper um, clippings, some non-governmental organization and gray literature. Um, the, number of items returned was quite substantial. It was over 6,900 items, um, sort of mostly in the book chapters um, and uh, article bits. Um, but I thought that there was a really nice range, um, particularly when you go into UCL Discovery, um, there's a great deal of work on the operations and management of university estates. Um, it's primarily uh, sociological and educational research, um, and also predominantly driven in the United States and the United Kingdom, as I found it. Um, I tried to filter through some of these items based on their focus of context, the methodology and methods, and whether or not they would respond to my key questions. Um, so some data, um, because I think that the data is really important, the sort of macro level. Um, you look at student numbers, staff numbers, the university facilities, um, what physical spaces have been allocated for teaching, learning and research and housing. Um, what are the capital resource investments universities and private providers or um, external bodies are making. And frequently I found that there were discussions around how private individuals, frequently alumni of universities in the United Kingdom, specifically England, um, had invested in the development of a new housing block, a new school or college. Um, and it was substantial amounts of public or private investment. Um, I looked at the total number of sites. So what is the physical print of the universities in England? And what is that mix of buildings? Um, I was surprised to find that in many cases, the number of buildings that were residential um, exceeded the number of non-residential buildings. Um, and to look at sort of the internal areas and the grounds areas. So what is it we're working within? How big or how substantial are those? And where are they located in the sort of broader footprint of the university? Um, as, you'll man as many of you will know, um, the sort of postgraduate and undergraduate student numbers have been relatively um, stable over the last five years in the in the English context. Um, total undergraduate uh, obviously dominates um, the total number, but postgraduates are becoming a larger percentage of the, of the overall student number participating in universities in England. Um, and so I'm mindful of the fact that while undergraduates um, by measure are the dominant um, group, uh, postgraduates have been responsible for uh, sort of the uh, percentage increase uh, over the last five years uh, relative to the previous uh, 20 years of, of, uh, of research. Um, I also found it really interesting when I looked at the HE staff by HE provider in England. Um, I was curious because uh, academic staff um, and non-academic staff came up 
And over the last sort of five years, um, non-academic staff actually exceed academic staff um, within universities. And I thought that was a very interesting sort of finding. For me, it was quite surprising um, because I think that the dominant discourse is from the perspective of the, acad the academic and the academy. Um, and by that, I, I think that, you know, there's certainly something to be said um, for the importance of including uh, non-academic voices um, in the discussions around the design and the delivery of facilities in universities throughout England. I think there is a huge sort of bubble um, or bubbling conversation around how the end user informs the future design of the university estate and what are the strengths and limits of that approach. Um, and how do you balance uh, the academic and non-academics voices at the table? Um, particularly, I, I believe when you consider um, how important or essential non-academic staff have been particularly highlighted over the last 12 months, um, perhaps as ever essential, but more in sort of the purview of the discussion um, because we as a group collectively um, saw our entire narrative and, and experience of the university as a place we routinely visit um, as a ritual um, and as part of our life rhythm um, sort of, um, if you will, uh, frustrated and, and, and really changed. Um, I wanted to throw up some of the university and building spaces. I apologize, this, this table will be um, probably a bit difficult to see or, or just a lot of numbers thrown at you. Um, but I was curious because I thought it was important to sort of highlight the number of sites, um, the total hectares um, and the total gross internal area of the universities in England, um, particularly the colleagues of uh, myself at the Higher Education Design Quality Forum and OUD, the Association of University Directors of Estates. Um, focus a lot on the complexities of managing such a dynamic group of built environments across a myriad of different sort of urban, suburban, and rural contexts. Um, and the way in which we do that um, becomes very difficult to generalize when we realize at the more specific local level, um, the conditions within which our colleagues and ourselves are operating are frequently um, share some things, but also frequently diverge. Um, I also sort of went into the work by OUD. Um, they do a really cool report um, every year for since 2014 um, on the estates management. And in their estates management report for 2020, they wanted to highlight some of the key, um, the key uh, costs, uh, including things like repairs and maintenance, um, which account for 696 million pounds spend per annum, um, or roughly 31% of the budget of the universities. Of course, not just for England, but this is inclusive of the UK. Um, they also wanted to, or highlighted the energy costs um, as 426 million pounds per annum, or roughly 19%, cleaning 12%, even security is roughly 8% of university budgets. And if you think about the capital expenditures highlighted by OUD um, over the last year, um, and how important and expensive it is to operate and maintain the university just as it stands. It, it likely leads us into a sort, of, um, a sort of conversation about how universities uh, manage to make these costs work, how they manage to also, I think, accommodate the costs, especially when, say, over the last 20 to 50 years, I think there's a strong case to be made that the public um, has changed the way it invests in higher education from a granting model to a student loan system in the United Kingdom and, or specifically in England. And that that um, encourages a certain question um, and a certain question set around how these costs are shared and what universities do to respond to the changing funding regimes they're operating within in order to be able to meet their cost obligations and their budgetary obligations just to maintain the physical environments we, we generally use um, on our time. So when I went through the literature and research, I found a number of really interesting 
proposals around how to study the university estate. Um, I start here with uh, Professor William Locke, who many of you will be familiar with. Um, he did a really nice paper uh, in 2004 published on the university estates as an impact on university estate strategy. And he was very keen to sort of pay attention to things like construction project costs, to the data, to the regulatory frameworks, both nationally and regionally and locally, and trying to understand how universities operate and manage their states within those contexts. Um, later, Temple and Barnett um, were looking at the idea of the university and what it means to be a university, ideal, ideally, or I, as an idea, um, and how the university estate as a physical space, as a material space, um, gives the opportunity to question and critique and investigate uh, what being a university means to the people who are in the space and how the physical environment is kind of an archive um, for the ideas about what a university is across history. Um, Temple also uh, picks up this sort of question set in his work on learning spaces in the 21st century. He did a really wonderful monograph collecting a lot of diverse views um, from a lot of different sort of academic perspectives on what the learning spaces would look like in the 21st century and what factors would dominate shaping the, the, the learning spaces. Um, now we see that unfold in things like uh, sort of, uh, if you will, more mobile or, or if you will, uh, learning spaces that are keenly or, or, or precisely designed in order to allow people to move around in them. The static lecture hall, um, as many of you might, might say, um, is under immense pressure, especially now. Whether or not it stays or it does not stay, I think is a question for debate. But certainly we're asking whether or not the, the 250 to 500, sometimes a thousand person lecture halls in our institutions is a viable way of teaching and learning going forward. Um, I wanted to also give a, a note and, and some appreciation to Maggie Seven Baden. Um, Maggie Seven Baden works a lot on how technology has shaped the way in which individuals, students, and staff utilize physical spaces within universities and the importance of the physical space being adaptable um, to those rapidly changing technological advancements or not. And the kind of pressure points that not being um, really aware of how technology has moved the conversation of the built environment on has an impact on how students expect something from the physical environment and their experience of it doesn't necessarily always meet that expectation. Um, Brent Carnell uh, works in uh, UCL in the ARENA um, Center for Research-Based Education and his work on the physical university and research-based education strategy I thought was really very interesting. He looks at how policy planning and practice as a, both an in institution and sort of um, as it relates to staff practice, uh, academic, non-academic academic staff practice, really does affect um, the research base and the way in which students and staff engage both with the places that they teach, learn, and research in, and with each other. I think um, the relationship of of peer to peer and student to staff is something worth highlighting, and I think um, Carnell does an amazing job to do that. Um, Professor William White, all out of Oxford. Uh, I follow their work because I find it so interesting. Uh, Professor uh, White is a historian, an architectural historian, and he has a, a session coming up, I believe next month on the material histories of the university. Bef uh, some time ago, um, he wrote similarly, uh, has written several books and articles uh, on the material history of the university and how the architectural conventions that were deployed at different points in history have shaped both the physical nature of our universities and their adaptability and how we see them now um, as ever, um, as something that can both liberate and constrain what it means to be a university and to teach and learn and research um, in this time. Uh, my peer and good friend, uh, Luke McCrone out of Imperial College um, has done an immense amount of work and is writing his thesis on the formal, informal and intermediate space use in universities. And I think that it's something that right now as ever is a critically important topic to discuss, um, particularly as uh, Luke highlights in his work, how these spaces are used by the students and staff who routinely operate within them every day and visit them every day um, 
are, is really important to how we see the sort of connective tissue of the university, the formal and informal, if you will, finding a way to meet together and finding a way to be together um, and how the importance of the physical estate allows for that as a, as a facilitator to happen. Um, and then finally, just to note, um, to Dr. Lamb, uh, who has been working extensively on how to distinguish the economic sort of functional, social, and environmental key performance ind indicators of university estates. I think this is really important, particularly in a sort of assessment and monitoring regime, where the way in which we represent the work of universities um, often now is distilled down um, in, in a number of ways, but no, no no way to get out of it. Um, we need to be able to represent the work that happens in our physical estate and how that work um, can be measured. Um, we need imaginative ways of doing this because there's a lot that should count that is not counted. Um, there's a lot of things that happen um, on the day to day that doesn't ever get picked up, but is no less absolutely elemental to the way in which students and staff and the wider public visitors and guests, um, even someone who is a prospective student just imagining themselves somewhere um, can transport themselves to a place. And being able to do that, I think, um, and being able to represent it in an empirical sense is really important. Um, so some of the key themes I found in my lit review, kind of the historical importance of university estates. I note this because in a number of texts, it was the, um, the era in which the, the university emerged, the medieval university, um, the universities of London, um, the civic universities, red brick universities, uh, if you will, the universities of the 1960s, some have called them the plate glass universities. You have the open university um, and you have uh, private universities, the post 1992s, just to name some. Um, and really how across history, um, the time and place and conditions, uh, both policy um, and financial conditions surrounding the, the emergence of the universities in those distinct time eras or periods was so crucial to their physical form. Um, also, the location and perceived quality and the facilities fit for purpose. Um, so a number of scholars note that location and the perception of the quality of the physical estate are two pull factors for prospective students, prospective staff members to consider an institution. What will my quality of life in the university be? What will that university look like when I land there? What will it be like to be there day to day? Is that somewhere I can imagine myself being? Um, and then to consider the, co the condition and the maintenance of the institutions. These are rarely conversations held in academic circles around what, it, what is required to maintain these facilities. However, as the data shows, these are immensely expensive, capital intensive, and, and also, if you will, um, impactful uh, facilities. Uh, Professor Locke notes that there are very few social institutions that bear the range of physical, or physical um, facilities that universities do. And so accommodating that, accommodating everything from a sports pitch to, uh, a grocery store or a market is not an insignificant task and it requires intense capital resource. Um, the regulation and responsibility of the estate. So who is regulating the estate? Is it done at the institutional level, the regional level, the um, national level? And how is that sort of metric or uh, matrices of different uh, uh, policy and planning and uh, practice frameworks applied? Do they work together? Who holds responsibility for what within the institution? Um, because frequently I found in the text that people highlight when it doesn't go right and amplify when it goes sideways or wrong, but rarely, rarely takes time to measure and evaluate and assess over time. Uh, we sort of how the estate has maintained itself, how university estates have maintained themselves, and the sort of trade-offs and cost benefits of the way in which it's being done now. Um, and to, to care a great deal about the funding regimes, as I say, for a substantial period of time, the university grants uh, committee funded through grant huge capital projects across numerous universities in England. That is no longer the case 
And frequently we are in an environment where we are having to prove even before we do something that it will add value. Um, we are having to demonstrate that there is a possibility that if we build this building, there's enough people who will use it and enough people who will pay to use it to make it work to those who are lending us the funds to do so and to build it in the first place. This puts immense pressure on universities. And I'm not here to suggest that it is not important that they be able to represent and uh, qualify the, the sort of uh, value for uh, for costs or the operational costs of the facilities. What I'm suggesting is that it, 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 it should not be lost on us that there was a time in which the university, the university grants committee up to Hefke was able to give substantial pots of funding um, and uh, to do so um, and, and um, how to do so and for the purposes of just preparing um, for, um, if you will, how the future might look if you transition from a grants-based system to a more loans-based system. And this sort of what uh, my supervisor, uh, Dr. Vincent Carpentier calls the substitution effect of moving from these public to private focuses and how that moves in a dynamic way back and forth. Um, also, we are seeing a huge amount of interest in the sustainability of material spaces. So what is the material we're going to use to build or to remodel the existing structures we have on our state uh, as part of our states on, on our universities or within our universities? Um, for some, this is within the the context of a campus and for others it is not so. Um, it is more urban like at UCL. Um, and to consider our, our questions around the sustainability of the material as focusing on whether or not these buildings are buildings we build for the short term, the medium term or the long term. And do they resonate or relate to the immense interest and focus on sustainability, particularly reducing our carbon impacts, our energy and water consumption, our waste, water and carbon production, um, and being key on the operational costs. Um, and I want to go uh, finally to the data. So we've seen the data as a means of evidencing to inform design, operation, maintenance, and usability, rather than evidence determined. I, I try to use the term evidence informed because I know that evidence is not in its own sort of on its own in a, a silo going to make any change. Um, but I think there is a certain degree of urgency that we feel now, especially um, with, with the climate emergency we are in, um, to consider how we can take part and make an, in, an influence or take um, a stand or, or, or have an impact on the way in which our built environments in the future um, will or will not be sustainable and support those who come after us. Um, and uh, I have this timeline. I won't spend too much time here, but just to say, you know, in regards to COVID-19, there's been an explosion of discourse around how COVID-19 has revised our entire approach to what a physical estate is for the university and what it can do and what it cannot do and how it can and cannot work. Um, and certainly this conversation is emergent and complex. It is ongoing and important and, and importantly so. Um, I wanted to say though, just as a quick note to highlight that whilst in spring 2020, the government came to shut down university access for all but essential personnel. There is rising amounts of literature now noting that actually there were a number of staff members and some students living in halls of residence who were unable to leave, um, either unable to leave for security or safety reasons or just in order to keep the lights on and keep the buildings from going into disrepair, um, there was a requirement for, for students and staff to continue to continuously maintain and monitor those operations. Um, and how really the way we sort of held in a holding pattern over the last 12 months, 16 months, um, is indicative of, I think, the important questions around how quickly we were moved out of our normal routines and rhythms and rituals uh, using the sort of to, quite, to use the terms of Henri Lefebvre, um, but also how we can now be more systematic and thoughtful about how we re-enter these places rather than just rush to, to return to exactly what was. I was telling a colleague of mine not too long ago, I think it is vitally important we ask now not only 
what was, what did we experience and sit with that experience of COVID-19, but also to ask, how do we go in now and do something perhaps for the only time in our lifetime and assess how people, students, staff, visitors, guests are utilizing the physical estate that is the university in ways that would be immensely helpful to the way in which we design and develop the future of our university estates going forward. Because I, I feel the importance is not in just returning to what we were, but in using the incredible amount of work and energy from scholarship and uh, and the public more generally to inform how we build um, an evidence basis, a baseline of understanding um, in a way we may never have been able to before. So what's next? Um, I, I take a more social justice approach um, to the university material spaces. I think there's a great deal of interest um, in the university uh, and what the university provides materially. Um, but I think we also need to make some notes about how that relationship is, uh, what that relationship requires, and who is sitting at the table making the decisions. A number of the papers um, in my literature review, including a number um, I highlighted earlier, focus on the importance of representation and feedback, but not as a performance, actually as a means and a mechanism to continuously revisit both how the physical environment is and how it's being utilized in time and across time. Um, and who is picking up on university estates? As I say, uh, Hisa and I would work very closely. Um, now the Higher Education Design Quality Forum also working very closely. Universities, UUK, Guild HE, the NUS, the Office for Students, a number of university and non-university bodies have a substantial interest in this conversation right now. And I think it is important that those bodies work together um, and that scholars who are in uh, faculties across England and beyond um, can have an opportunity to ask good questions and to generate feedback um, and possibilities for the future of how university estates will be utilized. Um, Cross-disciplinarily, I think that my work at the intersection of education and the built environment is hugely helpful. Um, but I think also um, there are a number of other scholars that have been doing this before me for many years. And that I hope there will be a number that come after me um, who, uh, you know, or work with me now, if you will, and focus on how we can work together to use our different perspectives to inform better questions um, and also to give colleagues a sense of contribution and buy-in to the way in which the built environment around them is being shaped. Um, and I think that uh, that is something that leads on to the next point, is a hybrid approach, the future of university estates. Uh, a number of my colleagues across uh, the peace and the world are discussing whether or not it's a moment where we can visit the opportunity or the possibility um, of creating uh, more mixed times, time use of uh, the university estate rather than sort of periodizing everybody exactly in the same place at the same time. What will the future hold? And, and what will the future hold when AI and AR allow a professor to hologram themselves into a student study bedroom or to hologram themselves to a beach on the other side of the world to give a lecture? How will that change the nature of what the university estate will look like? Um, and to really care about academic, non-academic staff and student feedback. I think that as I say earlier, just a moment ago, you know, earlier, that student and staff feedback is the thing that I miss the most in the work that I have been going through. And maybe that's the bee in my own bonnet, but I think it's essential. And to, to plan university estates, not just for boom bust periods, um, but to plan university estates with some semblance of planting it for a tree that we ourselves, as others have said, may never sit under, and to care about the quality of that environment as those before us cared about the quality of ours. Um, and just some opportunities to look at this might be through longitudinal study, to look at the cases of study. I think that case study is the dominant perspective I saw, um, and to look at more local, regional, national, and international comparative studies. Um, there's certainly been a breadth of work across the United States, the UK, Australia, the European Union. Um, those are just the Anglophone text I found. I know there is immense work going on in areas I haven't even seen and in languages I do not know. So I think it's important for us to keep the conversation open and going because I think that this conversation is going to provide opportunities for a lot of 
considerations and a lot of new information or new, new to me information um, and to maybe use more qualitative and mixed methods approaches. Um, I think that it's easy now, especially when we're staring in the in sort of the the moment into immense um, uh, reductions in spending from the public sphere on higher education and universities. The university of state is often one of the largest expenditures, just under um, staff. Uh, salaries. So if, if the operations and the physical estate is second only to staff salaries, it's something we have to be really clear about how we go about managing, I think, and, and how, we, how we manage the managing um, into the near term, especially in times like now, when um, I think that there is no less a hunger for higher education, no less a hunger and a desire for university estates and participation, um, but certainly the conditions um, lend themselves to to uh, asking how we will do that and who will be at the table when the decision makers make decisions about um, who gets to be and be in the university estate and who does not, if you will, and, and or who shapes the future of how these estates are formulated and formed and utilized going forward. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks, Zach. Uh, who shapes the future? Well, let's hope we all have some say in that. Now I'd like to give you a say in that hypothetically, at least with my question. Um, imagine that you were site planner um, and uh, let's say master planner. So you've got mm. the whole everything in, at your fingertips for the new um, Shadok University in Warwickshire. Uh, mm -hmm. And that this was an opportunity to design a university which reflected contemporary patterns of living, contemporary role of student residences, students living away from residences, students living in families, uh, mature students, uh, and also allowed you to reconfigure the relationship between online communications and face-to-face -face and in-place physical forms, uh, and allowed you to, you to put priority within a no doubt limited budget on some buildings, some facilities rather than others. What would you do differently that would, you know, compared to what we currently have? Oh, wow. Well, if I was able to master plan a dream, if you will, given the, the contemporary approaches where students are spending a lot of time in their residence halls in informal, uh, living and learning centers. Um, I would say my first, uh, my first interest would be to create, to continue to create opportunities for uh, students, peer-to-peer -peer interactions and students and staff interactions. I think that I would give way more space to the, interlo to the interlockers between each of the, uh, if you will, departmental um, uh, groups. Um, I would build buildings uh, that were playful. I would try to integrate as much greenery as I possibly could and access to natural environments and natural open space. This was a huge point made by our colleagues a couple of weeks ago um, that when the pandemic hit, students and staff num numerously focused on access to and participation in open spaces um, and surrounding areas. I think something that feels embedded in nature. If I'm in Warwickshire, I want to be as close to nature as possible. I want to be with nature as much as possible. I want to take advantage of the nature around me as much as possible so that I don't feel like I just sort of go from A to B. A and B are actually in the same suite um, and really make that a focus. I think also given the, the way in which technology is allowing uh, peers, students and staff to utilize different spaces in different ways, to think very critically about the multiple uses of space um, by different category or by different categories or by different populations of students and staff. Um, but I would I would build the university as a place where you saw it as sort of a what Paul Temple calls a common pool resource, where we all work. Um, I think to share. Uh, and to create a sense of equity around both our planning and our policy and practices within those spaces. 
Oh, that's not a bad uh, attempt at an impromptu answer to a very <laughs> difficult question. Uh, well, folks, if you want to redesign your university, you know, you've just got some free intellectual property there. Watch the YouTube video. Um, I've got four people on the call list immediately. That's Lee Rensema, Vincent Carpentier, Lauren Clark, and Seung Lee. And I'm going to ask Lee Rensema to come in. Hey, hi, Zach. Thank you very much for a riveting talk. Uh, it's, it's great to hear about your work. And uh, um, for me, explore a, a domain of higher education that I really know nothing about. Um, so professing my ignorance there, uh, I'm, I'm, I was intrigued by your talk because uh, I look at commercialized and, and for-profit forms of higher education. And so many of these will minimize their, their physical presence or their uh, certainly their state's costs to the, any degree that they can. Um, so many of these are you know, described as unbundled forms of higher education. Um, and that those you know, would, would include your for-profit institutions, online providers, branch campuses for certain. Um, and so that got me thinking about um, the for-profit component of privately owned estates and how that plays out in contemporary management decisions uh, to expand or contract university space. So, how, how do you theorize, I was curious, how do you theorize, you know, this, this encroaching uh, outsourcing uh, uh, strategy in, uh, in the university, say in England, but with a, with a large physical presence? Is this a form of unbundling uh, of higher education? That is to say like an internal problem, that's something about higher education, um, or is it more of just a phenomenon that's happening across sectors? I mean, if you look at, you know, any, any private, uh, businesses across London, they're all also minimizing their, their estate's profile for the same reasons. So is it something within higher education or is it just, you know, uh, a general, well, um, uh, estate's problem? Yeah, I think this is a really important question, especially, um, as you note, in, in, an, in situations where private providers, uh, both the university is a private provider and who they contract with are private providers. Um, I hesitate always to dislocate uh, the conversation about responsibility or the locus of responsibility, because in my mind, all of it is underpinned by the public. Um, the public is, is essential. Uh, the the public policies that allow for private ownership of things like housing and buildings is itself not an absolute given, right? So your, your statement leads me to believe that the rentiership that has risen um, is a byproduct of the allowance of money and capital to move into places where originally there was deep public investment in the design and development and maintenance of these facilities. And yes, uh, the private groups may minimize costs. Universities no less do this, yes? I mean, there is no less somebody sitting in the estates management teams and administrators saying, how do we reduce our operating costs in order to shave off a quarter million pounds or something like this over the next term, for example? Where are we gonna get, where are we gonna get this money? Um, I think that I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold anybody to account as, is it, you know, is it an issue within higher education or is it simply a reflection of the broader social context and conditions within which everybody is operating? So perhaps it is, that is my way of saying the same thing. It is the public's, um, how the public views itself and the attitude and perspective or perception it has of what the institution is for, what the built environment the institution maintains is for. Um, and do, you know, if you're sitting in a private, you know, university, is this simply a matter of minimizing costs, minimizing liabilities and just focusing on making sure that you can cover the rents in relation to um, the, the um, tuition fees, if you will, or the, the way in which that's happening. I would say um, there's a number of colleagues, including Professor Alexi Marmot, who note that it's, it is frequent that universities lease their uh, are, are leaseholders and, and lease the buildings, but either never sell the building and certainly rarely sell the land. So for me, the building is a temporary thing and the land is what is essential. To me, the building is a suspension of nature. Whether or not it is profiteered and profited by a particular group calling themselves the, you, the private university, um, that's something that we as a sector or we as a group, um, we consolidate and allow for.
um, because we make a determination that they can exist and that that function and, and formulation of higher education can exist. Um, and certainly I'm sure there is a huge long debate about whether or not uh, what I just said is, is hot tea or not. But I think that there's, there's something to be said about the fact that um, I can't evacuate the public in my mind from from any of those things, even the private ownership uh, of, a, of a singularity, um, like a building or, or, or a, a plot of earth. Um, and so for me, it's a question really of uh, maybe a, a bit too much Thomas Piketty, a bit too much uh, who, who, who owns the land first, who decided how to divide it, and then who maintains it. Because really in my mind, we are stewards rather than owners. I am a steward of land. I am not an owner of the land because at some point I will not be here. So. Maybe university is the same. Uh, thank you both uh, for that exchange. Uh, our next uh, question comes from Vincent Carpentier. I think Vincent is your supervisor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. This yeah. could be kind of an insider question. <laughs> Take know, it away. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Zach. I mean, great to see you and I uh, uh, really enjoy the talk. And, uh, you know, very stimulating. A lot of, uh, you know, uh, key themes you identified. My, my original question uh, is about uh, commonalities and differences uh, regarding the themes and issues uh, associated to estate, university estates in different countries. I think that's a huge question. So I'm going to phrase it differently. When you develop your research program uh, and uh, you decide to compare you know, England or the UK with, uh, let's say, two or three other countries, which one would you you know, select and, you know, why in some ways. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, I would first, uh, I would probably first look across the Atlantic to the United States, um, but not the whole of the United States. I would probably pick up if I was doing a comparative, say of England to uh, a state if you will, within the United States of similar population density, um, sim I mean, similar number of universities, similar makeup in this way. Um, I think that the universities in the United States and the UK share a number of, of conditions right now, particularly a loan-based system for participation, uh, per or do a loan-based dominated system of participation and financing higher education. Um, I think also the private investment in the um, the estate is a huge thing, especially in student housing in the United States, and especially in private colleges for their estates. Donors and alumni are huge investors in the development of, of the estates of many universities in the US. So I think in my mind, um, if you compare, say, the, the English context, I would select a state in the US simply because I think that the, the political, economic, and social conditions um, may be comparatively possible or pa comparatively useful. Um, if I look across uh, from the United Kingdom towards Europe, I think that it's difficult for me to imagine um, being able to do so at this moment. I think if the European Union or member states of the European Union form themselves or focus on a similar model um, of, of, um, of reducing public investment. Um, there was a huge uh, article written last week out of the University of Von Amsterdam about how in the Netherlands, they are looking at uh, increasing reductions in uh, investment in their higher education institutions, particularly universities that have long um, been given immense government support. Um, and the approach to what a university is, is a very public thing in the European Union. And I'm finding it increasingly more private in the, U the UK and immensely private already, consolidation, consolida consolidated as private, um, even if with a public name in the United States. Um, you know, and I think for me, um, there's certainly a case I would hope to go between the US, the UK and the EU. I think they, I look uh, to places like the Scandinavian countries and the Nordics as not, not comparable, um, or I look to somewhere um, where uh, you see immense investment in the publics, uh, for example, in, in, uh, in China, where in the main public investment is quite high, relatively speaking to, um, or the modes, uh, relatively speaking to financing it being publicly funded in those spaces. Um, but yeah, I would, I would stick probably to the US UK for now. 
Thank you. Thanks, Vincent, and thank thanks again, Zach. Um, Lauren, Lauren Clark. Hi, Zach. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I hope you're well. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, Luke's work on formal, informal, intermediate spaces and what you think we can learn from COVID-19 and campus closures about the importance of providing physical spaces for interaction that might occur outside the classroom. Um, because as like an educator at the IOE, I find that something that's really lacking with my students right now that they only get to engage with each other over Moodle or in formal classes. So I was just interested what you have to say about that. Yeah, I, I, would, um, I would say, uh, and I've had this conversation, um, I've, I've, I've rather I've been able to have um, a number of conversations with uh, Luke for some time and his work I think is gonna be so amazing. I don't wanna say too much, uh, just outside of my own thoughts, um, as you note, because his thesis is just getting almost done. Um, but he is someone who, as you note, really picks up on, because he both worked in the university as a student representative, he was the president of Imperial College Students Union, um, and he, uh, or uh, and focusing on education, and he works, he's worked in residence halls at Imperial College um, throughout his time as a postgraduate researcher. And what, I think is so interesting is that he becomes he became an instrument of sensitivity to how the informal spaces or the interconnecting spaces were utilized by staff and students to take us out of these very formalized very sort of if you will presets about what uh, we were. I was the student and you were the lecturer. I was the the postgrad researcher and you were the um, you were my supervisor or, or my, re my research supervisor. And I think it's really interesting because as you note, something that I'm picking up on and is only coming from other students uh, on Twitter, on uh, TikTok, on uh, Instagram is this desire to return to those informal spaces, coffee shops, garden squares, uh, the ability to sit with your peers in, in the sort of entryways of the IOE. Um, I, I mean, I can't imagine uh, not being able to do that until I, until I see it happening um, for myself and for my colleagues. And um, I think that he really highlights um, the importance of those spaces and the fact that we make a lot of assertions about those places without a lot of evidence or data um, on which to base our assertion and that we need that. As Dr. Temple has said many times, um, you know, that we need that kind of information, if nothing else, to better understand the social relationship of, of people who are using those spaces and also how they relate to the spaces. You know, what, what is it about them that makes good design? Is it something we trust to the architect? Is it something we trust to the construction team? Or is it something we trust to administrators? Or do we actually say, actually, this is what we think we can do with this space. And this is why we think it's important to give people a space where they can be together without having to necessarily have an end goal in mind as actually sort of very important to what it is to be a university. Um, because I think that if we're always chasing being somebody and doing something and the somebody training we all get into, I think that we miss a number of opportunities to unpack who we are um, and to exchange and, and relate to others. I, I, for myself, will finish by simply saying, sitting in the couches at the entryway of the IOE, I had innumerable conversations with people from all over the world, um, just asking how they work today. And that was hugely helpful to feeling like I was part of the institution more generally um, and to unpacking any of the sort of bottlenecks in my thesis um, as we all face challenges from time to time. So yeah, I, he, he's someone who I think uh, will, be, will be picking up this conversation and I hope carries it forward. Thanks again, Zach, and thanks, Lauren. Seyong, Seyong Lee. Hi, Simon. Hi, Zachary. Thank you so much for your presentation. So my question is, I'm wondering how researching university states and other, I mean, how researching university states would be different from researching other forms of states. Like, how is it different from studying um, human resource research that studies how 
um, how they can change and develop their physical spaces to improve workers' productivity. I mean, how is this educational value, distinctive educational value of higher education is being addressed in your research because students are not workers and not everyone are seeking productivity in higher education. So it links to the question of what are your assumptions about students' needs that this, um, that this yeah, higher education state should meet. Yeah, this is really important, especially I think um, as it relates to mental health and well-being and how we locate um, the conversation of mental health and well-being, maybe in um, a sort of open and unfolding or um, infolding that occurs um, when we ask the, the students who are in these estates why they are here and understanding what it is about the estate that helps or frustrates um, their reasons for being here, if you will, and their use of the space. Um, I would say some of the feedback that my own research and my colleagues' research have picked up on are questions of uh, noise pollution in buildings being no like the, the construction of the building that allows noise to resonate uh, rather than allowing for some privacy or a sense of security. Um, I think that also, um, as you say, because students don't necessarily perceive themselves as workers or employers, they wish to use space more freely and at times find it inaccessible, either inaccessible because they can't access it, they've been locked out, or inaccessible because it's overflowing with other students and there's nobody, there's no way of being able to actually utilize the space. That's why we're finding that a lot of students are using third, quote, third spaces, coffees, coffee shops, cafes, restaurants, parks, their own study bedrooms have become one of the more dominant places where students are spending the majority of their time um, if they do participate in a residence-based education. Um, and being able, I think, to understand how the accessibility of space, um, not just in a traditional sense, but more broadly across a range of individuals needs to be rethought, I think, and revisited. Um, not the least of which because, you know, you have colleagues like Joss Boys at the Bartlett who works on disability access in university estates and higher education and how her work has summatively you know, propose that we need to think more critically about the way in which if we're going to remodel estates in the future, we think about the end user first and work out from the end user backwards rather than begin with the financial model and move forwards. Certainly that's easy to say and incredibly difficult to do, but I'm, I believe it can be done in partnership and in collaboration and cooperation with between students, estates, up management and administrators um, and staff. Um, and being able to consider um, those, those voices at the table who are sharing the table um, going forward. Um, and my assumptions about what students need, I think is probably the more important um, thing to respond to. Um, what do I think students need in physical spaces? Well, the data that I've looked at says they, they want access to open space, to good Wi-Fi connections, um, and they want access to a multitude or multiplicity of types of space where I can work individually, I can work in small groups, or I can work in large groups. And that if you can work individually in small groups and large groups, and you have a reasonable you have a reasonable expectation you will be able to do so when you need to. Either technology has allowed us to plan your, your showing up to a study room with four of your colleagues, as we do in the IOE library, right? You know, you, you, you set up the date, you set up the time, you do, you do the Google Docs and you go, um, and you're good. Um, but I assume that students need to feel that the physical space around them was well thought through, well organized, and well maintained. I think that it, I think it's a moment to say that the folks who maintain our estates are essential, um, and that we often don't consider them or concern ourselves with them when we're thinking about what the impact of the estate is. But I think that if you walk across the university and you see the energy going into keeping things. Um, clean, keeping hedges trimmed, keeping sidewalks clear, keeping everything, you know, usable. 
I think that itself speaks volumes to how um, a university represents what it what it cares about. It should care about the people who care about the space because if you care about the details, the bigger things will be able to happen. But if you're overwhelmed by um, having to worry about whether or not you'll get a chair, having to worry about rubbish on the ground everywhere, having to worry about whether or not, I mean, this is not for me, um, this is for me where we can be, we can create a baseline of expectations. We will keep our house in order and clean. Um, and in terms of what do you students need? I think technology will determine that. And I think the technology will drive that. I think in the future, colleagues right now are suggesting that AI and AR will allow us to hologram our faculties into wherever we want them to go in the world in due course. Um, so how will our physical estate accommodate that? Um, how will we revisit these? Um, and, you know, in my, my assumptions are very much that um, what a person makes of the place they go to is everything. So I guess a, a, better, a better way, a better statement is, I don't presume to know what you will make of where you are or where you go. I, I, I think that that's something that I leave very much to the individual. I think that what I care about is the policy and planning and the practices that allow where you go to feel like somebody cared about it before you arrived. Our final question, Thanks. our final question is from Victorita, Victorita Triff. There she is. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you, Salman. Uh, congratulations, Zach. It is a very interesting uh, research. Uh, I was uh, interested in uh, a relationship uh, between uh, academic and non-academic staff and the student feedback. In your opinion, what are the parameters that uh, uh, can describe this relationship according to spaces? Thank you very much. Sure. Um, thank you for the question. The, the feedback from uh, academic and non-academic staff and students for us highlights the value or the importance of each group both internally and between, between themselves. Um, students highlighted their relationship with other students and staff, both positive, neutral, and, or positive, neutral, and, and not so great. Um, and also staff often highlight to us um, in our work, the importance of students as the reason that they're in the building to begin with, and that that drives their ethic of care and their sense of a duty of care um, towards the students that they work with and, and the students that they support. And I think that for me, um, it's about creating more opportunities for those kinds of conversations about getting feedback and representing students and staff in not just one-offs or as cross sections, but across the year and creating new opportunities, maybe either through an app or through uh, new feedback mechanisms. Um, I don't wanna survey everyone all the time, but if, if we have, you know, uh, a mechanism that allows us to, to generate both formal and informal feedback loops, I think that would be immensely helpful to how we better understand how people utilize these spaces. I think that's something that Luke Macron is doing, uh, Dr. Carnell has done certainly at UCL, um, and I think that colleagues like uh, Professor Marmot and, and Professor Boyce, Dr. Boyce, um, are doing as well. And they're trying to create an ecological way in which we understand um, how student and staff feedback can be better utilized to both understand how these spaces are being used and turn from, as Paul Temple suggests, space to place, um, and also how in the future that might be, uh, it might be informed by what we see now uh, in order to, to better understand where we are and where we're going, um, just, to, just through the very daily, daily life and daily practice of how we work together. Thank you very much. And thank you, Zach. Um, and thank, thank, thank you too, Victorita. Um, good to see you at the CG conference the other day. Uh, Zach, uh, that's a uh, second erudite presentation you've given us, and we're very grateful that you've shared your work so well with us. Uh, and you know, a smaller webinar than some, but a good quality one in terms of those who are here and those and the discussion that occurred after you spoke. Um, so we look forward to having you back.
at a future time. Uh, let me invite you all to tune in again in two days' time, where Igor Cherikov is going to drop a bombshell on QS ranking. He's going to demonstrate quite convincingly that QS is, has a conflict of interest in pursuing its ranking and that it reshapes its object, so-called objective ranking according to its commercial relationships with individual institutions. That is sensational and important news. I think a lot of us felt this was going on, but Igor has demonstrated it convincingly using data based on the Russian case. Um, he's already given this uh, presentation once in Berkeley in California, and he's about to do it now in the global webinar for CG. So uh, tell people about this. It's an important webinar on Thursday. Uh, it's about time the rankers were brought to account. In my view, it's about time the commercial rankers were expected to operate according to proper social science and uh, non-conflict of interest principles. Um, and our webinar program continues. So uh, we've, we took a week off last week after our CG conference, but we've got webinars stretching to the 16th of November in our forward program. And it's a very interesting set of discussions on a great range of issues coming from all over the world. So we look forward to seeing you on Thursday and in subsequent Tuesdays and Thursdays from then on. Thank you very much, Zach, again. Bye for now.